Hello friends from near and far, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dion and today we're going to look at something very interesting. The watch that lost the quartz. Alright, so that was the first of what is probably a, a lot of inaccuracies in this video. It wasn't this watch that lost the quartz war, there were a few other watches as well. And this brand actually survived uh, for quite a while afterwards. But the movement type inside this watch was one of the key factors for the decline in Swiss uh, watchmaking industry in the 1970s. So let's have a look. We see the crystal is completely yellowed. A couple of the hands have fallen off and the watch is not running. Let's open it up and see. What the... So what we have here is a pin pallet watch, or a pin lever watch as some call it, also known as a Roskopf watch. So I think it's quite obvious already that uh, this would be, let's call it a budget watch. We see when we get the crystal off that the dial is actually in pretty nice condition. It has a little bump just to the left of the 12 o'clock marker. Looks like a dial foot imprint. So the dial is secured to the movement with a couple of very rudimentary clamps. You see them here. And these uh, pin lever uh, watches, many of them have zero jewels. Also indicating, of course, uh, that it was a uh, budget watch, budget movement. And it was even uh, intended to be so. When uh, Roskopf invented this movement in the late 1860s, it was uh, exactly meant to make watches affordable for the common man. And they were produced in big numbers, all up until the quartz crisis, and in some regions even longer. This brand, UMF Rula, was an East German brand. And actually this brand has a pretty interesting story by itself. It was at one point probably the biggest manufacturer of uh, watches in the whole world. Because of course they produced for the East German and some other uh, Soviet bloc uh, countries during the Cold War. So they were actually in operation until 1990. But that was of course the year when the whole uh, Soviet bloc fell and the plan economy with it. So we took the balance off, let's uh, have a close-up of it. We see it's uh, not really finished to any sense of degree. And you see that there's no safety roller. There's also no uh, jewel for the impulse pin, it's just a steel pin. So obviously made to be cheap. And if you look at uh, the shape of the pivot as well, you can see this is a plain cone pivot. And cone pivots are very easy to make, but they introduce a lot of wear to the mechanism, making the watch run very inaccurately after a while. Of course, higher quality watches use the conical pivots. Let's just uh, continue to take uh, this movement apart. And one uh, note of caution as well. This video does not really have a happy ending. There's no success story here. This is not a watch that will ever run well. But that's also not the purpose of this video. Phew! Dodged a bullet there, man. Getting this watch to run to plus uh, minus four seconds would be a challenge. So of course having zero joules means that uh, all the pivots uh, simply rotate in the base metal. And given that the base metal is brass and the pivots are steel, you will have some wear of the pivot holes. And wear in the pivot holes uh, basically means lower accuracy 
uh, reduced lifetime of the watch and so forth. So taking the train apart we can see that uh, most of the wheels look quite uh, normal except for the escape wheel which we'll have a bit closer look at later. Let's also have a look at the barrel construction. This is uh, the mainspring. We can see that uh, the end of the mainspring is just bent. And this is not a repair by a former watchmaker. This is actually how it came from the factory. So again, really designed to be as cheap as possible. And here we have the aforementioned uh, barrel lid with the barrel arbor built in. Again, a very primitive construction. So before I'm coming back to the main topic of this video, I just wanted to conclude a little bit about uh, this brand, UMF Rula. So as mentioned, they actually did continue until 1990, basically because they could. There was no competition, of course, in the marketplace in East Germany. And they actually produced pin pallet watches all until they closed down. And interestingly, the brand has been revived in the last uh, few years. There's now a brand called the TUW Rula. And they sort of carry the torch from this, uh, this old brand with uh, obviously updated movements and the sort worth checking out. But let's get back to what's supposed to be the topic of this uh, video. The watch that lost the quartz war. Maybe first a little bit background. So the quartz war or the quartz crisis or the quartz uh, revolution, call it what you want. They're just all different terms for uh, what happened to the watchmaking industry in the 1970s. And just before the 1970s started, so in uh, 1969, you had a lot of events that sort of led up to this uh, whole uh, thing. You of course had the moon landing. You had the Longines uh, actually introducing or let's say previewing the first quartz watch called the Ultra Quartz to capitalize of course on the Ultra Chron uh, watches they had that were also revolutionary in their own uh, right. And then on the day after Christmas, of course, uh, Psycho introduced the Astron, the first uh, quartz wristwatch. And there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about this whole uh, quartz revolution or crisis or call it what you want. And the myth uh, basically goes like this. The Japanese flooded the market with millions of cheap quartz watches completely catching the Swiss by surprise and basically wiping out the Swiss uh, watchmaking industry. Does that sound uh, familiar? That is uh, kind of the version that has uh, prevailed and it's complete rubbish. First of all, uh, Longines was, as mentioned, the first to uh, almost launch a uh, course watch. And the Swiss have been working on this for a long, long time and actually launched their own quartz watch or quartz movement called the Beta 21 just a couple of months after Psycho launched the Astron. More than 20 Swiss companies were involved in the development of the Beta 21. So you had companies like uh, Omega, Rolex, uh, IWC, Piaget, Patek. They all launched uh, watches with the Beta 21 uh, not long after uh, the Psycho Astron. And just like the Astron, uh, their watches were also uh, with hands, so analog quartz watches, if you will. So, of course, the next step was to have uh, digital quartz watches. And initially they came with the LED uh, screens. So you might remember uh, these watches with the uh, red screens. Perhaps most famously the Hamilton Pulsar. That's worn by uh, Roger Moore in the uh, James Bond movie Live in the Thai. Really cool movie, by the way. I think that's one of the highlights of uh, Roger Moore, for sure. But LED is pretty useless uh, in a lot of ways. 
because it's very power intensive so uh, basically the battery is not going to last long so uh, they uh, started using LCD and Seiko was actually uh, the ones that never released LED watches they really put all their money on uh, LCD and of course that uh, worked out brilliantly there's also worth uh, keeping in mind that when the Astron was introduced it was not at all a budget watch it actually cost the same as a mid-sized car and it wasn't until uh, towards the end of the decade that uh, quartz watches started becoming very cheap and the main reason for that was a really massive foresight by uh, Seiko in particular really investing in the technology needed investing in the plants needed production capacity what have you so it was almost a decade so from 1969 to the late 70s the swiss just didn't see it coming so what did they do well they produced a lot of uh, pin pallet watches it's not easy to find the exact numbers but somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of Swiss uh, watches made in that period were pin pallet watches and you can sort of think also we're in the midst of the space era people I think that uh, in just a few years everyone will be wearing uh, silver jumpsuits and eat food out of uh, tubes or will be flying cars in the streets so people are really going for this whole digital thing so the Swiss uh, simply completely missed the boat they failed to see that uh, digital really was uh, coming massively and as a consumer in that time and day if you have the choice between a space age watch that is digital that has multiple functions and looks like it came from Star Trek or Star Wars and also runs extremely accurately or an old style unreliable watch that was just made to be cheap you could probably make it run to a half a minute uh, plus minus a day what would you choose? yeah I'll go for the pin pallet watch do you have a UMF uh, ruler one? Now, there were of course uh, other reasons as well why the Swiss uh, watchmaking industry went through such a hard time. Their entire business model was very outdated. They had a lot of manufacturers. And as we discussed in the previous uh, video about uh, Le Mania, one of the cool things with uh, working on vintage watches like uh, I do is that you get to see such a variety but that variety is obviously not uh, great for, uh, for business it is very costly to develop your own uh, watch movement so of course what the Swiss uh, did in the uh, early 1980s was to consolidate instead of having uh, 50 movements uh, in 100 watches you had basically 3 2824, 2892, 7750 which is very cost efficient and that's what got the Swiss back in the market together with of course the Swatch watch itself but yeah it did mean a demise of a lot of uh, very nice uh, watch companies of course uh, the uh, watch companies that went under weren't only producing pin pallet watches but I wanted to uh, show this uh, movement as uh, one of the key reasons and one of the maybe most misunderstood reasons that the Swiss struggled so much cheap crap is uh, cheap crap regardless and when you have uh, something other cheap that is much more uh, reliable looks cool for the day and age then yeah betting your uh, house on the cheap crap is probably not going to be uh, successful are you ranting against the um? are you ranting again? well uh, yes
So let's uh, pay a little bit of attention to this watch then. For those of you who turned off uh, the sound, you cannot hear me now anyway. But for those of you who have sort of listened, we have uh, put everything together. We're just oiling everything. And of course, uh, there are zero jewels in this watch. There were actually pin pallet uh, movements with up to 20, 21 jewels, which is a little bit of a strange thing, given that the whole point was to save money. But this watch has uh, zero jewels, so there are no uh, cap uh, jewels, no end stones. And obviously you cannot uh, adjust end shake either. So the way to do that is to actually adjust this screw that I'm working on here. This balance was very wobbly. So I'm trying to reduce the end shake a little bit. So we can maybe time this watch to a little bit of a degree. I'm going to try to adjust uh, the end shake a little bit more. And then we're going to put the watch on the timer. One thing I didn't show is the oiling of the pallets. This kind of movement has basically all the impulse on the wheel. So you can either oil uh, the, the wheel or you can oil the pallets themselves. Just put a little drop of uh, 941 there. So this is how it looks. Of course, before adjusting. As we adjust the watch, we see that uh, the beat there is creeping down and the amplitude is uh, going up. And ultimately we'll get to a little bit more acceptable uh, range. But in general, if you have an old pin pallet watch like this one, having it run to about uh, plus minus one minute per day is actually not so bad. So ultimately, after a little bit of uh, fiddling, I think if we get the graph to fit on the screen, we should be super happy. goes up and down like uh, sour milk in a kitten. But uh, we're gonna leave it there. Let's put the uh, second pinion driving wheel back on. I like to use this uh, standing uh, hand pressing tool for that. You can also use just a simple handheld uh, hand presser as well. Just gives a bit more uh, control. One thing you might have noticed is that there are a few uh, blued uh, pieces. So you see the yoke is blued, the screw for the rocker here is blued, the ratchet uh, was blued as well. And of course uh, nowadays we think of blued uh, metal as uh, something that's uh, high class. But uh, it's actually very easy to do, it just takes a little while. It's a manual effort, and of course in East Germany manual effort was cheap. So rather than being a sign of high quality, it's probably just that uh, the watch manufacturers wanted to put a little bit of their pride into uh, the watch. So it does look nice. One other thing to observe perhaps is that uh, these pin pallet movements are never complicated. There are, of course, the base functionality of showing the time. Sometimes you had with a date, but that's uh, pretty much it. It would defy the whole purpose of the movement if you started putting in a chronograph on this once, or a moon face, or a tourbillon. So uh, everything is quite rough with this watch. Moving the hands is a little bit rough, winding it is rough. 
So we've got the uh, hour hand on. Let's get the minute hand on as well. Uh, here we're actually using the handheld uh, hand press. All right, let's put on the second sand also. And the watch is actually a pretty handsome watch. I like the design. And this little red tip on the second sand is a pretty cool touch. So I kind of feel that this watch deserves a little bit uh, the deluxe package in the spa. So let's uh, oblige. We're gonna replace the crystal, of course. And the case is simple brass. No plating, no nothing. It has fixed lugs. Again, of course, made to be cheap. What's fun is, of course, that uh, nowadays base metal cases are a little bit in uh, vogue. Especially bronze, but also brass cases. They do get this uh, special patina. For this one, we're going to polish it a little bit. It's okay. The watch deserves it. So we're going to just use... Uh, the polishing machine on this. What? I cannot hear you. It's too loud. I said that we're gonna use. Oh, okay. I said that we're gonna use the polishing machine for this. We're using a pretty hard felt wheel on uh, quite high speed because uh, this case is uh, quite uh, thin, so we don't want to round the edges too much. We're also not going to make it look uh, completely shiny and new. That wouldn't look right with the dial and the hands. And if you want to remove absolutely all scratches from a case, it's uh, really not advisable to uh, do that on the polishing machine anyway. You should start by uh, taking out the deep scratches uh, by hand, and then you can polish the rest after you get uh, the deep scratches out. I'm not a master polisher in any uh, regard. So I'm sure there are better uh, polishing videos out there. What I do try to focus on is uh, making sure that if you have a flat surface, you use a hard wheel on high speed. If you have a rounded surface, you use a softer wheel on lower speed. Because of course you want to maintain the actual shape of the case. Not make round flat or flat round. So after uh, cleaning the case uh, with ultrasonic, we're going to do the final polishing. Again, what I'm uh, trying to go for here is to improve the case and make it look nicer. Uh, not completely uh, new looking, if you will. All right, sir, I think that's enough. We're not paid by the hour here, huh? All right, let's also then get uh, the new crystal uh, in place. Now that the case is uh, polished. One tip here is to uh, put the crystal in this uh, plate straight forward from your body. So instead of perpendicular. It makes it easier to uh, make these uh, teeth on the press uh, line up nicely.
It's a good practice to always clean the inside of the crystal before casing the movement. It's one of the most annoying things to find that there's a little piece of lint or something on the dial or I even saw a, a new watch that had an income block spring hanging from a hand. So that's not uh, ideal. All right, let's uh, put the case back back on. And then we're almost ready. And with the case back on, we can also put the straps on. These are glue straps, given that you have uh, solid lugs. So before we look at the watch on the wrist, let's just uh, have a look at how the case looks after a light polish. We didn't really want to go for making it completely new looking, but uh, at least shine it up a little bit. And before putting the watch on the wrist, let's have a quick uh, preview of what's up next on this channel. And there we go. The watch is uh, actually quite handsome. But as we saw, the movement is uh, not really anything to brag about. And with those uh, wise last words, we're finished with this video. If you liked it, I would really appreciate it if you can click like and subscribe. That will help the channel a lot and we'll get you more videos. We'll be back shortly. Until then. Ta-ta.